investment platform that provides early pre-traction entrepreneurs with fifteen to fifty thousand dollar investments. The issue is that eighty three percent of entrepreneurs today aren't served by today's capital options, and so we've created the convertible income share agreement, which combines an income share agreement with the founder and equity in their business to solve that problem, to provide that capital at the earliest stages. We've built a software platform that allows us to efficiently source, underwrite, and service these opportunities. We have a team of financial experts and experienced technologists to build this platform and, and provide this capital. Um, our revenue model today is management fees on assets under management. The next phase is subscription fees from uh, other investment entities that will set up a convertible income share agreement program to increase the entrepreneurship in their ecosystem, whether that's universities, governments, um, other angel groups. So yeah, today we're raising on WeFunder uh, operational capital of a million dollars to grow the team and continue developing our software. Awesome. Tell me a little bit about your background and, and sort of why you decided to do this. We've done a lot of interviews with people who are kind of disrupting how entrepreneurs fund their business. And I think this is sort of like the grand movement of this, really, if you consider like Pipe and a few other companies that are trying to find creative ways to fund early companies and, and even companies that are further along the pipeline, if you will. Um, tell me kind of your background, how you started to realize there was this problem and what you kind of realize is like a, an obvious and, and sort of adequate solution. Yeah, my background, um, graduated finance, University of Texas, worked investment banking, oil and gas in Houston, and then worked at a single family office uh, there in Houston as well, uh, where I got to see all sorts of deals, work on deals in other geographies, all across the stage spectrum, early stage, late stage, real asset deals. So I got to see how deals were funded up and down the growth stack. At the back end of that um, time at the family office, I started pushing my career more towards early stage venture uh, and startups. That's really what was interesting to me. A lot of smart people, a lot of cool technology. And so at the end of 19, when I found myself kind of thinking through what's next in my career, this idea of really getting capital into the hands of entrepreneurs was interesting to me. Uh, I looked at traditional VC, uh, maybe getting a job at a VC, but the key insight was when I learned about income share agreements. Uh, they're being used in the education space, coding boot camps, et cetera. And I thought that instrument was perfect instrument to really allow investors to come in and invest in a person to say, yeah. hey, this person I think is going to be successful. And uh, so I'm going to take a bet on them. And so what we did was combine that income share agreement with equity in the founder's business to give us an instrument that worked for both founders and for investors. I think it's brilliant, the idea. No question about it. Like, so for people listening to this, you can go to wefunder.com slash Chisos, just so you know how to spell it. It's C-H-I-S-O-S, -S, little S-O-S for founders. Um, I, I actually think this is brilliant. You're not the first person I've had on the show who talks about income uh, agreements, um, we had people on here talking about athletes and that's actually turned into a pretty big, pretty big business. Uh, that company I think now is valued at well over hundred million. Um, and they have a couple of, you know, Fernando Tatis is one of the people that have used it. And, you know, famously the school component is, is unquestionable. I, I think it's, you know, there are people who will come out and argue that it's, you know, it's the kids already saddled with debt and all this other stuff. The reality is this is a much safer way to go. And I have taken far worse loans out of my life that I got nothing for, literally. Um, and I'm paying more than I actually took out, which is not good. When you look at what you're doing, I think the funny part that's awesome is that if you ask most investors, particularly at the early stage angel investor slash seed round, what they will tell you is historically their best deals are investing in people. They, and if they decline the deal, they still go, you're great people. We invest in people, people, people. And then they go, oh, but our, our mechanics don't work. We can't get in, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then the founder sort of laughs like, well, did you really mean it? You actually mean it. Like the idea that a founder who's got, you know, relatively no experience, who wants to launch a business, needs that 50,000, 20,000, even 100,000, even to just kind of get the runway to build what they're trying to do to get the time to prove the thesis, you know, 
most, most companies shit out then that's, that's when they do. They don't, there are obviously tons of companies who burn millions and millions, and millions, and, but that's a different story. If you were to look at the hundred percent whole of all the startups, the vast majority of that, you know, they say 97% fail the vast majority. And, and also, by the way, for those listening, it's not that high. It's like, people just like to say that number. If, if you looked at the even 90% or 85%, the bulk of those will get to like under a million total raised and just sort of like try to identify, is this a thing? And they crap out at that point. And to me, if you had an investment as a person, an individual wants to invest in the founder, not the company per se, in the terms that you're setting up here, that I'm not hooked on that one idea. They may have another idea. They may have another couple of things. And to me, that that is like such an obvious opportunity. Tell me a little more about how that's being received. How does it work? For entrepreneurs, it depends on where they're located. So if we're talking to an entrepreneur in San Francisco, a lot of times they say, well, why wouldn't I just go raise traditional equity from angels? And our answer is great, go do it. If you have traction and you can raise from angels, go do it. Um, but that's not the case for a ton of entrepreneurs, yeah. especially outside of the coasts. And so we have an open online application. We're trying to get our name out there in front of entrepreneurs in the Midwest and the Southeast, you know, outside of San Francisco or New York. And there's a ton of entrepreneurs that absolutely love what they're doing. We've heard multiple times from, you know, founders that have founded companies in the past that have said, man, I wish I had found y'all or y'all had been available when I was starting my first company. Awesome idea. It's positive reception unless someone has in their mind, hey, equity is the only way to go. I don't want to take on an income share agreement. And to them, we say, hey, we're a tool just like all the other capital options out there. We're right for a lot of founders, early stage founders, not right for every single one. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And the reality is every deal, whether it's an equity deal that you have no personal guarantee in or not has repercussions. And, you know, and so like, you you know, I, I hate to say this as a well, buyer beware, like you, every founder finds out after the fact that they've made a bad deal with a bad investor. And, and then they're like, shit, I would have done, you know, literally almost anything else. And I could vouch and say, uh, what you're offering is better than credit card round, which is what I took. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's also to me great to just have more options out there. We were talking about this on the last podcast, like just the fact that there are these options create an opportunity where literally a founder may end up getting a deal with a VC and they may not use you, but you contributed to them getting that deal because they had that option on the table. They weren't stuck to like, it's this or nothing. Uh, so ultimately I think it's a great thing for the market. Talk to me about how you like, where are you guys at in the process? Are you, are you already funding people and funding deals that way? Or is the marketplace, is it kind of a two-sided marketplace Like you're out as a business trying to sign up all the individual investor type people who would be interested in investing in human beings as capital, if you will. Um, and then on the other side of this, you're obviously scouting out for founders or would-be founders and probably going through schools and things. Yeah. Uh, so we've made 11 investments. So we've deployed close to half a million dollars. So this, this thing is out there. It's live. Our application's live. We had, I think, close to 100 applications in, in May. So this thing's, this thing's rolling. Um, our job today is to raise the investment capital. So we're raising a fund too in order to deploy that capital into about 250 entrepreneurs over the next two years. Um, that's really the first phase of our business is raising our own capital, deploying our own capital, uh, really fine tuning the mechanism. As we look towards the future, the goal is really let's open source these terms so that anyone can use these terms to get the capital into the hands of those early stage entrepreneurs. And we'll provide the software to do it because there's underwriting mechanisms that groups may need help with because there's servicing mechanisms on the income share agreement. We've built all of that. And so we can say, hey, here's the terms. You have your capital. You have your people you want to invest in. And we'll help you do it. We'll help you set up the program. So that, awesome. And so I'm, I'm looking, at. I'm looking at WeFunder. You guys have raised a half million with a goal of a million as your set goal here. Um, been rolling for a little while here. Looks like you've got. Uh, let's see, doesn't say how many investors you currently have, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess it's 200 plus investors at this point. Yeah, a little over 300. Perfect. Yeah. See, my eyes are pretty good. I got a, I got a general <laughs> idea of when I see a number. Um, I think it's a super interesting deal. So people are investing in your operational fund, right? They're, they're, this is to like the, you know, hire the right people, marketing spend, grow the business. This isn't investing in the fund itself. Exactly. Yep. It's capital to help us grow our team and develop our software. None of it is, is in the actual investment fund. 
Correct. But obviously as an owner of the potential, you know, potential owner of the business, if this were to roll into equity or however it's, you know, situated at the conversion, uh, you're looking at owning a stake in a company that potentially owns a, a small amount of money in a bunch of different companies in your fund. Are you, I guess it's not owning companies, owning people in a way. Uh, how does this get paid out? Is it like returns to the investor first? I'm sure you guys take a management fee or some sort of fee at the top. And then there's probably some recurring fee that comes through from you guys, or how does, how do, how do you get paid out of the funds? Is it traditional like any other venture fund? It is. So the today's funds, pretty traditional management fees plus carried interest on the back end. Yep. So if any of our companies in the portfolio really hit it out of the park, we obviously have that carried interest on the back end, everything, all the, the fees, all the carried interest, everything flows up to Chisos LLC, which is where our investors are coming in uh, through the WeFunder. So number and of, number of mechanisms for revenue there. So if, if you guys are successful, meaning you're just printing cash or you become public or you become a, an acquisition target of somebody else's, uh, obviously acquisition is pretty obvious and IPO would be fairly simple as well that these people have stock that they get the trade out at that point, unless you bought it out earlier. Uh, would you be paying dividends at some point on this or how, like, how do you foresee, you know, you're early. So like, I don't like asking people like exit strategy because anything can happen. But how do you view the business ultimately? Yeah, it's really, like I said, we've got the two phases. Everything rolls up to the top co, Chisos LLC. And our plan is to make distributions. Uh, so as we have revenue that covers our expenses, we want to distribute that capital. We're owners in the business. Uh, we've got investors in the business. And so we want to get that capital back in, back to the investors as quick as we can. Awesome. I love it. This is a, a really... It's the first I've heard of, of actually like dropping this into the founder's hands. It's always been, you know, if the kid graduates and becomes a founder, cool, but like entrepreneurs are a different breed. And so like the risk, risk is always a little higher with them. There's a the chance to flame out is as good as a chance, if not better than the chance of success. Um, but I do think that when you, when you back entrepreneurs and founders in particular, um, when they have money pinned to a company that like it's the company and not them there, there always tends to be this like, Oh, we got to keep fighting. Even though, you know, the end of the, like, you know how the story ends, like you already know the company's not going to work, but you're just battling and it ends up taking more time. I actually think that if there were more founders who took positions like this, they would be less likely to sit in a company that's probably not going to work out and would move on to the next thing because the, the tie is them, not, not capital in the business, which I think is super novel. Yeah. And, and, because it's so early, we're trying to help them, you know, iterate and pivot and find something that works before they put a bunch of money into scaling, which again, kind of helps uh, chances of success if you can get it right early on before having that sunk cost, like you said, tons of money, just trying to make it work. How do you, just last question, how do you, so when a founder has success, whether they're making money because the company is selling or they're making money because they're drawing drawing a salary, how how ultimately do you track how much money they're taking home and how you'll get, you know, how you access that capital. Yeah. On the income share agreement, there's a number of factors. So, uh, you know, this, they're self-reported saying, Hey, you know, has your income changed? Uh, provide us with documents. And then at the end of the year, we're reconciling with uh, tax returns as well. So there, there's some, com some compliance mechanisms in there, but we're trying to build that relationship with the founder, help them bring our resources and our network, to them. So we're trying to keep that relationship in place as well, uh, no matter what happens with them as a founder. And I think yep. that's what separates us from say, you know, a bank where you're just a number and a loan book. Um, we try to have that relationship with them while they build their business. I love it. Cause you can, you literally can imagine like there's a ton of founders who find they build a company or try to build a company. The company may not be successful in itself, but like they have cracked a code on how to make money in other avenues. And so they do that to fund themselves as they try to build this dream that they've had in their head of something else. In your case, that, that company may well have investors, but that person has backers essentially. And if, if I could go back 15 years and, and even 10 years and come out of grad school and be like, all right, if someone would pocket me hundred K and let me go and like do my thing, I will pay you back. Trust me, I'm good for it. Like I would have done that deal instantly. Cause I, I knew I, I knew ultimately where I was gonna be successful. Like I knew what skills I had. It was just a matter of like decisions were based on risk. So it's like, oh, like 
do I believe a hundred percent in this idea? I want to go raise a ton of money, which is needed. Like it, everything has its own place, if that makes sense. Like, and for people listening, like if you're, you're starting companies, there are times that you jump into things where like, I'm only like 80% like kind of think this is a thing and like, but I'm going to try it. There are things that I've thought are great ideas that I literally just wasn't in a position financially or personally to do. And so I sit at this shit job and I don't do it. In reality, it's like, I could have gone to someone like you. I could have gone to Jesus and like had some money, but like, you know what? I'm going to take this jump. I know I got something here. And if I, I'm wrong, it's okay. You're still, I'm still going to make money at something else and you'll still get paid, which is awesome. Yeah. It's, it's a tool in the toolkit. We need tons of tons more options out there to help founders start their business, grow their business. Like you said, you've got the revenue base guys. They're doing great work. Once the companies have revenue, we're trying to provide a solution that pre-revenue when there's not a ton of good options. So yeah, tool in the toolkit for, for founders thinking through how they're going to get going. Interesting tool for sure. For those listening, go to wefunder.com uh, slash Chisos. That is C-H-I-S-O-S and make an investment in this company and help them get this uh, tool in the hands of more founders. Yeah.